Hey there, adventure seekers. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're kicking off an incredible journey through the heart of Italy. In this series, we're diving into the top 100 most beautiful destinations across this stunning country. Whether you're a fan of breathtaking coastlines, historic cities, or picturesque countryside, you're in for a treat. In part one, we'll uncover some hidden gems and must-see spots that showcase the rich culture, history, and natural beauty of Italy. Number one, Lake Como. After Sardinia, we headed north to explore Lake Como, nestled at the foot of the Alps. Lake Como is a must-see destination. My favorite spot on Lake Como is Verena, a charming paradise. Verena was founded in the 8th century by local fishermen, and I spent several relaxing and enjoyable days there. I loved strolling through its cobblestone streets and alleyways. In the center of the town, there's a large square with a beautiful church. What I enjoyed most about Verena was its northern shore, where there are restaurants and a pebble beach from which you can watch the gentle waves alongside majestic swans. Another stunning place on Lake Como is Bellagio, known as the Pearl of Lake Como, located in the heart of the lake. My wife and I took a ferry from Verena. We wandered through Bellagio and greatly enjoyed its picturesque charm. Number three, Italian Riviera. Next, we moved on to the Italian Riviera, also known as the Liguria region. The Italian Riviera is a small crescent-shaped region that stretches all the way to France. Number four, Cinque Terre. At the end of this region, on the Italian side, lies Cinque Terre, made up of five coastal villages dating back to medieval times. You can't reach Cinque Terre by car, but you can take a train from the city of La Spezia. The northernmost village is called Monteroso al Mare. I believe it's one of the lesser known spots, but it's definitely worth a visit. It has a wonderful beach and an incredible view of the Riviera. The next village to the south is Vernazza, probably one of my favorite places in Cinque Terre, and the only one of the five villages with a natural harbor. It's the first fishing village of the Italian Riviera. I was there in August, and it was packed with people. So if you can, try to avoid visiting during the summer months. Another favorite town of mine is Manarola. I thoroughly enjoyed walking around and found great spots to take in the scenery. What I loved about Manarola is that there's a place where you can swim, protected from the waves. You can also jump off these rocks. Right next to Manarola is Rio Maggiore, it's the southernmost village in Cinque Terre and the ideal location to stay, as it offers plenty of accommodations and restaurants. The scenery in Rio Maggiore is breathtaking and beautifully colorful. Number five, Portofino. Another of my favorite towns is Portofino, one of the most idyllic spots on the Italian coast, globally renowned for its picturesque charm. Since the 12th century, it has been a retreat for royalty and artists. I attempted to visit during the peak of summer, but had to turn back due to the lack of parking space. That's why I suggest visiting during less crowded months or very early in the morning. But without a doubt, it's a place worth seeing. A stunning beach you can visit in Portofino is San Fruttuoso. You can only reach it by boat or by hiking from Portofino, which takes about an hour and a half. This cove dates back to the 10th century and has a statue of Christ submerged 15 meters underwater. Number 6. Venice. Next, we headed to the iconic city of Venice, one of a kind in the world as it has no streets, only canals. It's made up of 118 islands connected by over 400 bridges. 
Venice was the largest maritime and financial center during the Middle Ages. Nowadays, it's one of the most popular tourist destinations. You can explore the canals in a gondola and visit St. Mark's Square. It's truly a unique location, and I hope you get the chance to visit. Number 7. Valdobbiadene. Now, let's visit Valdobbiadene. It's about an hour's drive from Venice. This is a wine region full of beautiful vineyards and famous for its Prosecco wine. The landscape is stunning with its vineyard-covered hills and very peaceful villas. One of my favorites is Guia, located just a few minutes outside Valdobbiadene. This region is absolutely magical. Number 8. Lake Garda. Next, we will visit Lake Garda. It's located right between Venice and Milan. This is Italy's largest lake. I drove around it, and I can confirm that it's immense. It's nestled between two mountains. Along its shores, you can find numerous villages. Heading south of the lake, you'll find the Scaligero Castle, built in the 14th century. It's one of the best preserved castles in Italy. What I liked the most was its fortified dock, which served as a refuge for neighboring fleets. Moving east of the lake, you'll come across Monte Baldo, a mountain range overlooking the lake. To reach the top, you can take a cable car from the lakeside town of Malsacene. Once at the summit, you can walk around and enjoy the breathtaking views. Another fascinating spot nearby is Madonna della Corona. This incredible sanctuary is built into a cliffside. Its construction began in 1530, and it served as a refuge for pilgrims who enjoyed the serenity of nature and being at peace with God. To reach the chapel, you can park your car in the town of Spiazzi. Italy is full of scenic churches. Number 9. Verona. Nestled beside Lake Garda is the enchanting city of Verona, famously known as the setting for Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Verona is a stunning medieval city, and I love how the river winds through its heart. You'll also find the Verona Arena, an ancient Roman amphitheater. The 2026 Olympic Games will be held here. Number 10. Bologna. Our next stop is Bologna, a two-hour drive from Verona. Bologna is one of Italy's healthiest cities and the seventh most populous, with around 400,000 residents. What fascinates me about Bologna are its medieval towers, built between the 12th and 13th centuries. The tallest stands at 300 feet. It's estimated that around 180 towers dominated the city during the Middle Ages. Over the centuries, many were demolished or simply collapsed, and only 20 remain today. The most famous are the two towers, with the tallest reaching over 97 meters and leaning about 2 meters. Both towers tilt slightly, appearing on the brink of collapse, but it's hard to imagine all the history they've witnessed over the years. Number 11. Milan. Next, we'll explore the magnificent city of Milan, located in the Lombardy region. Milan is a remarkable city and Europe's second most important economy after Paris. It's also one of the four fashion capitals. The city is a blend of modern skyscrapers and classic apartment buildings. One of Milan's most notable landmarks is the Duomo di Milano, Construction began in 1386 and took six centuries to complete. It's the second largest church in Europe and the fourth largest in the world, which is truly astonishing. Galleria Vittorio Emanuele II. If you're in the mood for shopping, you can visit the world's oldest mall, built in 1877, with its breathtaking vaulted ceilings.
Number 12. Lake Maggiore. We then head to Lake Maggiore, located about an hour's drive from Milan. It's the second largest lake in Italy, with its northern section extending into Switzerland. This lake reminds me a lot of Lake Como, and one thing I love about it is its castles and unique architecture. Number 13. Lake Lugano. Right next door, we find another beautiful lake called Lugano. Like Lake Maggiore, Lake Lugano straddles Italy and Switzerland. The Swiss border of the lake is fascinating. There you can find the town of Campione d'Italia. Another great town by the lake is Varenna, which lies on the lake's edge with Switzerland just across the water. Number 14. Aosta Valley. Next, we head to the Aosta Valley region, located in the Italian Alps. It's the least populated region in Italy. What I love about this place is that it's surrounded by the highest mountains in Europe, such as Mont Blanc. Number 15. Great St. Bernard Pass. While we're still in the area, we'll visit the Great St. Bernard Pass, which connects Aosta with the Canton of Valais in Switzerland. It's one of the oldest passes in the Alps with a fascinating history. The pass has been used since the Bronze Age, and in 1800, Napoleon Bonaparte crossed it with over 40,000 soldiers. This is also where St. Bernard dogs were trained by monks to find lost travelers. It's truly amazing to think about all the history that unfolded here. Number 16. Stelvio Pass. Another remarkable pass is the Stelvio Pass, located in the Eastern Alps. It's the second highest paved pass in the Alps, with an elevation of 2,757 meters. During World War I, several battles were fought here between the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Kingdom of Italy. Stelvio Pass is a popular spot for testing car skills as it has over 75 hairpin bends. Number 17. Stelvio Pass. The Stelvio Pass is a popular place to test car skills due to its more than 75 hairpin bends. Number 18. Tirano. Then we head to the town of Tirano, which is about an hour's drive from the Stelvio Pass. Tirano is a peaceful town known for being the departure point of the Bernina Express. The journey this train takes is considered one of the most scenic in Europe. It starts in Tirano and crosses Alpine passes in Switzerland. It's a lot like the Polar Express come to life. I would love to take this train someday. Number 19. Valeria Glacier. Next, we'll visit the Falaria Glacier, one of the most beautiful glaciers in all of Italy. It's absolutely immense, and there's also a very picturesque waterfall nearby. Number 20. Piedmont Region. We now head to the Piedmont Region, situated at the foothills of the Italian Alps, near the borders with France and Switzerland. This area is renowned for its stunning landscapes and exquisite cuisine. Number 21. Turin. The capital of the region is Turin, with its most iconic landmark being the Mole Antonelliana, which stands tall against the city's skyline. Turin is also known for being the first capital of Italy before the national seat was moved to Rome. Number 22. Sacra di San Michele. Another beautiful spot nearby is Sacra di San Michele, located 45 minutes from Turin. It's recognized as the most symbolic monument of the Piedmont region. The foundation of this abbey dates back to 966, and it was completed over the course of the 13th century. Number 23. Piz Waterfall. If you enjoy nature, you can visit the Piz Waterfall, which is an hour and a half from Turin. The round trip is 3 kilometers. The waterfall is immense, cascading down the Italian Alps. Number 24. 
Longhe Area. For wine lovers, a visit to the Longhe area is a must. This region features many hills dotted with vineyards and quaint hilltop villages. The area is famed for its wines, cheeses, and truffles, particularly the white truffle from the Alps. I was also captivated by the castles that can be found perched atop the hills, with my favorite being the Saralunga Dalba Castle. Number 25. Ponza Island. We then head to visit Ponza Island. I had no idea this island existed until I saw some videos and just had to see it in person. It's located off the west coast of Italy. To get there, you need to take a ferry, and the trip takes two hours. Ponza is steeped in history, having been a popular spot during Roman times. Many ruins and tunnels from that era still exist today. The best way to explore Ponza is by boat. We rented one and toured the entire island, and I was amazed by the volcanic cliffs and countless caves. My favorite memory of the island was when I anchored my boat and spent hours swimming and soaking in the Mediterranean sun. The most famous spot on the island is Chiaia de Luna. This beach is known for its towering white cliffs and crescent shape. You can reach it by boat or through an ancient Roman tunnel that you can walk through. I couldn't believe how massive the cliffs were. Number 26. Porto Flavia. Let's head back to Sardinia and visit Porto Flavia. Located about an hour's drive from Cagliari, Porto Flavia is a port with a unique mine that opens into a cliff. This mine was used to transport minerals directly onto ships. Completed in 1924, it stands as a remarkable feat of engineering in a truly unique location, giving it an almost surreal appearance. Number 27. Tavolara Island. Another beautiful spot in Sardinia is the area around Tavolara Island. It's just a 30-minute drive from Olbia. This is where I stayed during my time in Sardinia. The island is quite large and offers a perfect setting for sailing and snorkeling. You'll find stunning beaches like Porto Taverna, which offers incredible views of the island. Number 28. Cala Spinosa. Another fantastic spot on the northern coast of Sardinia is Cala Spinosa. It's about an hour's drive from Olbia, and from there you can see Corsica. The beach is truly gorgeous, with its smooth pebbles contrasting against the clear waters. Sardinia is full of amazing Mediterranean landscapes. Number 29. Dolomites. After Sardinia, we headed to northern Italy to visit the Dolomites. I spent several weeks exploring these mountains, and they were honestly some of the best days of my life. Number 30. Cicada. My favorite place in the Dolomites is Cicada. The green slopes contrast sharply with the jagged mountains, creating one of the most incredible landscapes in the world. To reach Cicada, I took two gondolas that carried me to the top, where the clouds cover half of the mountain. It was one of the best views I've ever seen. Places like this spark the imagination and make you feel like a child again. I hope everyone can experience this incredible place. Number 31. Alpe di Siusi. Another magical place nearby is Alpe di Siusi. Here, you'll find the highest alpine meadow in Europe, with the Sassolungo mountain in the background, which, together with the cabins, creates a dreamlike scene. The mountains seen from Alpe di Siusi are the Sassolungo. These mountains are truly immense. When I was there, I took the lifts. The view I found at the top blew my mind. I like to call these mountains the Black Gates of Mordor because that's what they remind me of. At the top, we found a small shelter, and it's a great place to climb and explore. On the way down, I drove through the area, trying to catch the sunset. I managed to get some incredible shots.
Number 32. Gardena Pass. You can also head to Gardena Pass. This pass links Val Gardena with Val Badia and is among the best places in Italy for a scenic drive. The road is flanked by mountains on both sides, making the journey through the Dolomites an incredible experience. Number 33. Val di Funes. A stunning valley in the Dolomites is Val di Funes. I remember seeing pictures of this place before visiting and couldn't believe it was real. Here, you'll find one of the most beautiful churches, surrounded by a landscape that looks like something out of a fairy tale. When I was there, clouds were draped over the mountains, creating one of the most picturesque settings around this church. Number 34. Lago di Braes. Next, we headed to Lake Braes. This is the most famous lake in the Dolomites, with its striking blue water and towering mountains in the background. When I visited, I hadn't showered for several days, so I decided to jump into the lake. Nothing makes you feel more alive than a plunge into some glacier water. You can walk along the lake's edge or take a boat out. It's truly a special place. Number 35. Jiao Pass. Another amazing mountain pass is Jiao Pass. The top of the pass is just 30 minutes from Cortina d'Ampezzo. My favorite spot here is Refugio Averao, the highest point on the pass. There's even a hotel and restaurant there. Number 36. Cinque Torri. Another spot I loved is Cinque Torri a group of five rock towers jutting out from the mountain. You can reach it by hiking from Giao Pass, but the easiest way is by taking a chairlift from Bai Dodones. Cinque Torri was also a battleground between Italy and the Austro-Hungarian Empire during World War I. Another incredible lake in the area is Lake Fedra, a 10-kilometer hike away. If you visit in October, the larches surrounding the lake turn a stunning golden color. Number 37, Vajole Towers. Another breathtaking rock formation in the Dolomites is Vajole Towers, a series of sharp peaks located in the Catenaccio Mountains. Reaching these rocks is quite the challenge, but it's worth the effort. The climb takes a full day, and you can even spend the night in a mountain refuge at the base of the towers. Number 38, Lake Serapis. My favorite spot in the Dolomites is Lake Serapis, which starts at the Tre Croci Pass. It's a small alpine lake with an incredible bluish hue. To reach it, you have to trek about 11 kilometers round trip. Although getting there is quite a challenge, the stunning scenery of the lake makes it all worthwhile. Number 39. Tre Cime di Lavaredo. The most iconic location in the Dolomites is Tre Cime di Lavaredo, a set of three immense rock formations. I was so captivated by this place that I spent four days exploring it. I witnessed the most epic sunrise here. When I reached the mountain's peak, I watched the sun gradually emerge. There's also this amazing area I like to call Mordor because it resembles a scene straight out of The Lord of the Rings. I stumbled upon these tunnels by accident that were used during World War I, where I had an unforgettable sunset. It's truly a magical place. Number 40. Rome. After climbing the Dolomites, we'll head to Italy's capital, Rome, one of the world's most iconic cities. Its history spans 20 centuries, with its foundation dating back to 753 BC. Roman architecture still stands today, with millions of tours each year to explore it. One of the most famous structures is the Colosseum, an oval amphitheater completed in 80 AD. It was the largest amphitheater ever built, accommodating 50,000 to 80,000 spectators. 
You can enjoy this structure from the outside or take a guided tour of the interior. Trevi Fountain One of my favorite tourist attractions is the Trevi Fountain, a Baroque-style fountain built in 1762. There's so much to see in Rome, and I hope you get to visit someday. Number 41. Vatican City While still in Rome, we'll visit the smallest country in the world, Vatican City, entirely surrounded by the city of Rome. The Vatican is the seat of the Roman Catholic Church and the home of the Pope, with a population of just 800 people. It was established 90 years ago, on February 11, 1929. St. Peter's Basilica St. Peter's Basilica is one of the most spectacular buildings globally and the largest church. Its interior is absolutely breathtaking. Artists like Michelangelo contributed to its design. Construction began in 1506 and was completed in 1626. Number 42. Calcutta Vecchia. A fascinating nearby village is Calcutta Vecchia, located about an hour outside of Rome. This small community is perched atop a volcanic cliff. In the 1930s, the government warned of the dangers of living there due to the unique terrain. However, starting in the 1960s, the village was repopulated by artists and hippies, who restored it, giving the town new life. Number 43. Civita di Bagnoregio. We'll then head over to Civita di Bagnoregio. When it comes to hilltop towns, this one ranks among my top picks. Situated in the valley of Bagnoregio, this ancient town was established over 2,500 years ago. Due to erosion and earthquakes, it has earned the nickname the Dying City. These days, only eight people reside here. Recently, tourism has sparked a revival. It's a truly captivating little town. Number 44. Naples. Next, we'll travel south to Naples, the city known for being home to Mount Vesuvius. Naples is a historic city with roots tracing back to Roman times. It's the third largest city in Italy, following Rome and Milan. Its name comes from the Greek word meaning new city. What's fantastic about Naples is its proximity to many beautiful places and cities. Number 45. Pompeii Ruins. For instance, just a 20-minute drive away, you can visit the ruins of Pompeii, founded in the 6th century BC. In AD 79, the city was buried under 6 meters of ash when Mount Vesuvius erupted. The ash preserved the city, giving us a glimpse into the life of the Romans. It's one of the most important archaeological sites in Italy and the world. Number 46. Ischia Island. Off the coast of Naples, you'll find several islands, including Ischia, one of the most scenic islands in the Gulf of Naples and the most developed. I absolutely adore the castles found there. Number 47. Presida Island. Just beside Ischia lies the stunning island of Presida. It's the smallest in the Gulf and less touristy compared to the others. This charming island served as the backdrop for films like The Talented Mr. Ripley and was also honored with the title of Italian Capital of Culture. It truly is a delightful place. Number 48. Amalfi Coast. We're now heading to visit the Amalfi Coast. I must say this is one of the most beautiful places, not just in Italy, but in all of Europe. The Amalfi Coast is located in southern Italy, about a three-hour drive from Rome. It's almost hard to believe places like this exist. Number 49. Fiordo di Ferrore. My favorite spot is Fiordo di Ferrore. It's one of the coolest beaches I've ever visited. 
Situated in a small fjord, it's paired perfectly with an arched bridge. This place is a paradise for cliff diving, with plenty of spots to jump from various heights. I had a blast doing flips into the water, which felt amazing. Honestly, it's an incredible place. You've got to check it out if you're visiting the Amalfi Coast. Number 50. Path of the Gods. After Ferrari, we'll take a hike along the Path of the Gods. It's one of the most renowned hiking trails where you can enjoy the best views of the Amalfi Coast. The trail starts in a village called Bomerano and ends in a villa named Nocell. The hike spans eight kilometers and will take you about three hours to complete. Along the way, you'll be treated to breathtaking views and can spot many old houses and farms in the meadows, contrasting with the coastal scenery. It's mostly downhill, which is great. If you plan to take this hike, I recommend starting early to avoid the heat and crowds.